In chapter 1 of Galatians, uh, we're looking at Paul's salvation, but also we're call, looking at Paul's call to the ministry. And uh, verses 11, 20, 11 through 24 kind of divides up in uh, Paul's pre-conversion, his conversion, and post-conversion, okay? And uh, it's a chronological uh, timeline of events and actions from the point of view uh, of the Apostle Paul. Now, you say, well, why is Paul going to such trouble? Well, you see, Paul is, is out to vindicate his apostleship. It's very important, okay? We talk about the Judaizers. Uh, they're coming in and... Uh, uh, they might be saying Paul's preaching another gospel, Paul's preaching an easy gospel, Paul's missing it on, uh, you know, uh, the Old Testament laws have to be incorporated in all this. And uh, so, um, if you destroy the apostleship of the Apostle Paul, you destroy, or the credibility of the apostleship of the Apostle Paul, you actually destroy the credibility of his message. That's why Paul's taking this such lane. Not only to talk about his pre-conversion, his conversion, and post-conversion, and set down a timeline of what happened, okay, uh, you, you see that, that he, he's concerned about the message, his gospel, that the Lord Jesus taught him. Now, I was thinking about that, boy, I'm so glad that, that I don't have to uh, uh, vindicate my pastorship in the sense of, uh, for the gospel. You see, we have the Word of God. You see, we have the Bible, we have the Gospel. You see, uh, we, you know, the authority is there. And what we need to do, not only as pastors, but as the Christians, we need to uh, declare it, uh, live it. And, uh, and so uh, we have the advantage because we have the message, we have the Bible complete. It is, it's, uh, the inspired record is before us and we, can, uh, we come from that, okay? Now, notice here, uh, the call of the Apostle Paul here in verses 11 through 24, not only in salvation, but in, in service. Now, uh, just quickly as we look back here for a minute, uh, like in verse 11, it says, uh, not after men. Verse 12, it says, not received by men. You see, uh, first of all, not after men means it wasn't man's, dis uh, man's devising. It wasn't something that men devised. It, Paul learned it from anybody. Uh, not received by men. There was no intermediate source. Uh, verse 12 says, it was not taught by, to him by man. Okay, and you say, well, wasn't the Lord Jesus a man? Yes, but we're talking about the risen Lord. He's talking about other apostles uh, there in Jerusalem, okay, and all that. See, the authority of Paul's gospel is by revelation, verse 12. For I neither received it of men, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. And so what we can say is that Paul uh, received his message or his gospel uh, straight from the Lord Jesus. I like in one place in Romans it talks about that how uh, Paul preached Christ's gospel. Christ's gospel. You see, it is the Lord Jesus' gospel. And he gives it to us and we are to be faithful. We have the word of God and we have the gospel. But see, uh, Paul's gospel came by revelation. Paul's gospel was not a reformed uh, type of Judaism as a Jew, Pharisee. You see, and you have to think about it, and that's why Paul uh, really emphasizes his pre-conversion experience there. Uh, for example, in verse 13 and 14, because before Paul got saved on the road to Damascus, he knew nothing of grace, did he? He knew nothing of grace. He knew a lot about works. He was very zealous, but he knew nothing of the gospel of grace. And he will find out he uh, he rejected the way. He he went out to destroy the way, the gospel, the Christian. And so uh, we see here uh, that that it was by revelation. It wasn't taught before he, you know, he didn't know it before he was saved. Um, the Apostle Paul is declaring in his pre-conversion life, verses 13 to 14, look, look what it says there. For we have heard of my conversation in the time past in the Jews' religion, 
how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. You see, uh, he didn't know about the message of grace, nor did he confess Christ. His religion rejected the Messiah. His religion was not based on grace, but merit. Now we could go to Philippians chapter 3 real quickly, uh, just to show you. Uh, again, Paul's pre-conversion, uh, it's like Paul says, I could not have known this before I was saved. Okay? It wasn't something I learned from at the feet of Gamaliel, or it wasn't by the Jew Jewish rabbis, or all the schooling. You know, they didn't teach grace. Okay, So Philippians 3, verse 3 for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But one things, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for loss, uh, counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done that I might win Christ. And that's see that's uh, that's grace. That's the gospel. And and before Paul's conversion, he knew nothing about. He knew only about confidence in the flesh, right? He didn't know anything about, you see, his pedigree, his, his family, his Phariseeism, his, everything, you know, that was all plus things, but he threw that all away. He counted as dumb, okay? Now, we could, uh, now think for a minute, just real quick, before we, we go to Saul's conversion. Uh, how did uh, Saul of Tarsus uh, go after the church in his pre-conversion days? Let me give you a couple uh, verses here. This is in Acts 8, 1 through 4. But we'll just, you know, uh, Saul was there consenting to the death of Stephen, okay? And then at that time there was a great persecution. This is Acts 8, 1. Um, it says, uh, verse 3, and, and, and as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. And then uh, uh, in... Uh, Acts chapter 9, 1 and 2, it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. You know, he, he, he was a one-man terrorist, it says. And he's going to uh, wipe out the, the church. And uh, but you see, his own testimony, he says, in 1 Timothy 1, 13, or we could go maybe to, uh, yeah, 1, 13, 14, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did an ignorant unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant in the faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. You see, Paul said, I persecuted the church. Um, I was very zealous for the Jewish religion. Uh, you know, uh, Acts 22, verse 3 and 5 says this. It says, uh, I persecuted this way unto death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, uh, also, uh, the high priest doth bear me witness in all the estate of, other, of the elders, from whom I also received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were, were bound in Jerusalem for to be punished. That was Saul of Tarsus before his conversion. You see, brother, he didn't know anything of grace. No, nobody taught him about grace. You see, the Lord Jesus did when God saved him. So let's look at now... Um, uh, back in uh, Galatians, Saul's conversion, okay? Now we can go to the book of Acts, and, and there's some interesting things there we're going to see in Acts 9. About, here's, in Acts 9, you know, uh, when, when Paul's on the road to Damascus, he sees the light, hears the voice, he's converted, he's saved, okay? Uh, and uh, that's the historical uh, uh, account, Luke's account. But in, in, in Galatians 15 through 24, we basically have... Uh, the Apostle Paul's account. He's setting down his timetable and things, okay? 
Now, uh, the Apostle Paul is, is saying again, okay, in this idea. Now, think of the timetable. He's saying, before my conversion, as I was converted, and after I was converted, okay, uh, this gospel was, was, he says, was not after men. Uh, I didn't receive it from men, and I wasn't taught by men. Okay? Look at verse 16, Galatians 1, verse 16. And again, we're just, we're quickly going through the chronological aspects, pre-conversion, conversion, and post-conversion, and then, Lord willing, if we have time tonight, we'll look at a little bit of Paul's conversion as it's mentioned there in uh, verse 15 and 16. But look at verse 16. Uh, notice the chronological. It says, To reveal his son in me, I might preach him among the heathen. Notice it says, Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. He's talking about his after he's converted. Okay? Very important. I conferred not with flesh and blood. Verse 17. Look what it says. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles uh, before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, say James and the Lord's brother. Now, verse 20 is like the, uh, you know, the oath, the, the swearing, as it were. He says, Now the things which I write unto you, behold, behold, before God, I lie not. So he's giving uh, his account, chronologically, historically, of pre-conversion time, conversion and post-conversion, okay? That, what? I mean, again, it's like a broken record, but this is what Paul's saying. I, I need to vindicate my apostleship. Why? Because I need to vindicate the message. You see, this, this message was by revelation. I was taught by the Lord Jesus himself. I wasn't taught after men. I, wasn't, I didn't receive it from men. I wasn't taught by men. Not by the apostles, not by Ananias, not by Barnabas, not by men, not after men, not taught by men. Uh, and again, it's before and after conversion. Paul's saying, no, no, I received it from the Lord Jesus personally. Now, notice what it says there in this uh, in verse 17. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. And so Paul is in Damascus, right? Uh, Ananias comes to him. Okay? There he leaves. In three years, where is he at? It says he's in Arabia. And it's interesting. I, I believe three years he, he, he sat at the feet of the risen Lord. Three years, right? Like the apostles there, like, uh, you know, Peter and James and John. Uh, they took three years of ministry. Now, the Lord Jesus is three years with Paul, personally, there in Arabia, teaching him what? The gospel. Teaching him uh, many things, actually. This is not the first time where we'll see that the Lord Jesus revealed himself to Paul. I mean, he, has, he talks about revelations in, in 2 Corinthians. He's talking, you know, the revelation of the church, the revelation, uh, revelation of, of the Antichrist. You see, there's a lot of things that the Lord Jesus, like the Lord's table, for example. Where did Paul learn about the, the ordinance of the Lord's table? He says, the Lord Jesus taught me. You see, in those three years there in Arabia, the Lord Jesus told him about the Lord's table, the Last Supper, and how it was changed, and what does it mean, Okay. And so this is what Paul's saying here. And so the emphasis, again, uh, Paul was not taught by men before conversion, nor after conversion. You see, that's why he begins in verse 1 of Galatians 1, Paul, an apostle. You see, uh, other churches that he wrote to that did not question his authority, he didn't have to put there, apostle. But here at the Galatians, he did, the church there at Galatians. Paul the Apostle. And so the, the goal here in, in, in 1 Corinthians, I mean 1 Galatians chapter 1, is that Paul is going to vindicate his apostleship and in order for he, him to vindicate his message. His message. Now notice here, in this call, uh, or let's say his uh, vindication of the message, you see, we just have to realize that the Lord Jesus personally taught. 
Paul personally taught him. Uh, the Lord Jesus taught him the gospel. Now that's why, for example, in, in if you look there in Galatians chapter one, uh, you know, uh, verse eight and nine, you know, that, that's hard, a hard anathema. You know, if anybody preaches any other gospel, we see Paul is saying, the Lord Jesus taught me the gospel personally, and he uh, called me to be an apostle, and the Lord Jesus gave me the message personally, and I'm not preaching anything else but what the Lord Jesus gave to me personally. That's, that's what Paul, and you see how important this is, especially when you get into chapter 2, when he has to face Peter and Barnabas, the other apostles, and the Judaizers, you see. Now, think of this story. Let's, let's quickly go. Uh, let's look at Paul's conversion as we see it here in uh, Galatians 1. Notice it says there in verse 15 and 16. So Paul says, okay, I, I vindicate, I'm going to vindicate my apostleship. And uh, before you really can do all that, right, you have to be called to salvation. You see, you're called to salvation before you're called to service. Paul was called to serve. Now think of that, brother. Paul was called to serve. And brother, all of us are called, as we're saved, to call to serve in the body of Christ. Now, uh, verse, uh, notice verse 15. But when it pleased God, well, that's, I like that word, but. Paul's good on that, right? Ephesians chapter 2. But, but, but God is rich in mercy. But, but God, you see, Paul is after his religion. Paul is zealous for his religion, putting Christians to death. But, verse 15, but when it pleased God. He's talking about his conversion. Who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen immediately I prefer not with flesh and blood. Notice that the, 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 you see, God has to save. It's God's work. First of all, you see, he was called to salvation. I believe that's eternity and in time. Uh, salvation is by revelation, okay? Uh, it's not by book learning. You, you have to, you know, like I was, uh, I was talking to Bill uh, Gates, and he said, uh, I said, you can't believe on someone you don't know. And he says, well, that's interesting. That's really interesting. But isn't that true? You have to read the scriptures, but you, you can come to a knowledge, a head knowledge, an intellectual knowledge, an ascent of historical facts about the Lord Jesus, but that doesn't mean you're saved, does it? No, salvation is by revelation. We'll see that. Salvation is by grace. Paul says, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. You see, one is saved by grace, and one, is, one knows the Lord Jesus Christ experientially can preach grace. See, why? You know, think about that for a minute. Can you preach anything else? Can you live for anything else? Can you, can you tell your neighbors and your families and your friends anything else but grace? You see, you have to fall upon your salvation experience. God saved me by His grace. Now, you know, majority of us didn't really understand what grace was, right? We we're a little baby Christian. But then we grow, and we come to the Scriptures, and, and after a while we get a little bit more dogmatic, don't we? We're, we're, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not willing to give a, a man 1% of, of the credit, or 10%, or 100%. You know, I want to give the Lord 100%, right? He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. That no flesh would glory in his presence. You know, I didn't understand all that when I was first saved, but I understand that now. And it's a point that we have to make it. See, and so someone who's saved by grace can now preach grace as they're called to the gospel ministry. Now, look at Paul's conversion here. Paul says his conversion is a pattern. It's how God saves sinners. Okay? 1 Timothy 1.16. Let me read that. 1 Timothy 1.16. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Christ Jesus might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe to him to everlasting, a life everlasting. Now, you see, I, I believe maybe, could you not see Saul of Tarsus as a type of how God saves a Jew? 
not only in this age, but in the millennial or in the tribulation. I, I can see that. Because the word, key word there in 1 Timothy 1.16 is long-suffering. Peter said, this is the long-suffering, long-suffering is salvation. Why? Because God is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish. He's talking about the elect. He's not talking about everybody. He's talking about every one of God's elect, all those given to the Father, or given by the Father to the Son, all the elect will be saved. And until that, what? God is long-suffering to us. You see, when the last elect or the last member of the church in this dispensation is saved, then, brother, we're out of here. God switches gears, as it were. He switches administration. He changes his program. He doesn't change. He changes his program, and he begins to work with the nation of Israel again. He promised that to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he's going to keep his promise. But for now, okay, Paul is a pattern, not only to the Jews, but I think to us too. For a pattern to them which should will hereafter believe to him on, uh, to life everlasting. Paul is a pattern, how, how gracious God is. How salvation is by grace, how God extended mercy, how long-suffering God has been to us. Each one of us that named the name of Christ before we were saved. But see, uh, as Paul's conversion, as we look at that in verses 15 and 16, we have to come away with this conclusion. It is a total work of God. It is a total work of God. Notice that the words or the verbs that Paul uses in verse 15. God separated me. God called me. God revealed His Son to me. Now, it's, it's interesting. Uh, we'll look at a little bit more about this. Reveal His Son in me. But you know what? When, when was the gospel preached to Saul of Tarsus? <coughs> there in Acts chapter 7. When he was holding the, the coats of the men who stoned Stephen. See, Saul of Tarsus heard the gospel from Stephen. You see, that's his book learning, as it were. The gospel was revealed to uh, Saul. He knew the facts, but then in salvation there is a special revelation of Christ to the heart. And then now, I like what it says there in, uh, in verse 16, to reveal His Son in me, that salvation, that I might, what, preach Him. You see, now Paul goes out and preaches Christ. He, he's preaching that Christ be revealed to sinners. <coughs> Now, before God can separate you to the office of service, God must separate you to salvation. And that's, and that's so true. <coughs> Look what it says there in verse 15. Let me ask you, is that true of you this, this evening? But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace. That's salvation, bro. Okay? Don't, don't get the horse before the call. Or don't get to well, Paul was called to be an apostle, but you see, you've got to be called to salvation before you can be called to service. It, it just doesn't happen any other way. And that's what Paul's saying. But when it pleased God, that's glorious. In uh, Psalm 22, let me read a couple of verses. Psalm 22, 9 and 10. Psalmist is saying this. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Jeremiah says this, and this is good. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Well, yeah, sure, God knew all about what or how he was going to use Saul of Tarsus. Isn't that true? I mean, let me just show you. Look at Acts chapter 9. Acts 9, um, what he says to Ananias, okay? Acts 9, verse 13. <coughs> then, then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard 
uh, by many this uh, by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a what? Chosen vessel unto me. To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Yes, Saul was ordained, predestined to be the apostle to the Gentiles. But you see, he was predestined and ordained, elected to be one of those sinners saved by God's grace. Okay? Uh, we're not saved by accident. We're saved on purpose, for a purpose. It's God's will. Notice it says there in Galatians 1, verse 15, But when it pleased God, you see, uh, according to His good pleasure, well, why are we saved? Why would He elect us? Why would He choose us? Why would Christ die for us? We, we come down to divide, you know, it's grace, but see, it's this here. It was God's good pleasure. He wanted to. He wanted to. It was His good, we weren't lovely or lovable or anything lovely in us, but it was His grace and mercy. God, it says, uh, but when it pleased God, let me give you another verse. This is, uh, again, about the separation. In Paul's, uh, you know, this, this idea of uh, God knowing us, purposing to save us. 2 Timothy 1.9. This is one of my favorite verses. 2 Timothy 1.9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Brother, that's eternity. You see, you were in Christ, in God's mind, in Christ, uh, as mediator, as surety, as a redeemer. Kinsman, you, you were in Christ, in Christ, and God would deal with us in Christ. No other way. No other place. But you see, it's in eternity. Now, Notice further on, as we think about uh, Paul's conversion, uh, God, it says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace, it was all of grace, the call of salvation, effectual, effectual grace, efficacious grace. When God called Paul, Saul on the road to Damascus, there was nothing that was going to stop Saul from trusting and believing and repenting. Because with the call, comes the enablement. That's the rebirth. God says, Lazarus, come forth. What happened? An effectual power, the work of the Holy Spirit, quickened Lazarus, healed him, gave him the ability to hear the call. That's what happens to every one of us. Every one of us. God calls, we come. Why do we come? We come willingly, we come lovingly, we come in humility, we, we're broken, we come confessing our sins, we come in repentance. But you see, it, it, will, it, will, it will always happen. When God opens your heart, you will come. Willingly, freely, for all His glory. Now you might not all understand all that, right? Okay? But as you get into the, you know, in, in the, it's like Spurgeon said, you know, uh, on the door here, it's whosoever will. We believe that. On the back side it says, who was ordained from the, from the foundation of the world. These are mysteries. These are truths that are beyond our comprehension. But see, both are true, right? Both are true. Notice here in 1 Galatians, yeah, 1 Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, um, verse 16. Remember I said, in a, in a sense, there are three revealings. Or like, you see, uh, Christ was revealed to, to Saul as, as Stephen preached the gospel. But see, there is also this special revelation. You see, salvation is by revelation. And then, uh, then Paul, as a preacher, would go out and preach Christ, and, and God would use that. It's, you know, and so, it says in verse 16, to reveal His Son in me. Uh, let me show you some verses. Look at Revelation, in uh, uh, Matthew 11. Matthew 11, talking about Revelation. Matthew 11, uh, 25 to 27. Matthew 11.
Matthew 11, verse 25. This is our Lord Jesus Christ. He says this. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me by my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. See, the Lord Jesus is, uh, is talking about the Pharisees, the, the scribes, the Sanhedrin. He's talking about the religious crowd, okay, that are rejecting, because we're coming to chapter 12 and 13 of Matthew, and that's, that's the dividing point. You see, that's why in verses 28 through 30, the Lord Jesus is giving out a personal invitation to Jews. To everybody, sinners. But see, at this point, uh, his family has rejected him, his nation has rejected him, and so now uh, he's you know, going to begin to talk about the mystery form of the kingdom in chapter 13 and stuff like that. But you see, uh, they have rejected him, him as king. He came with credentials. He came with miracles. He came with the word of God, a special mission, uh, message from God. They rejected that, but not all, did they? Did all reject? The babes. Okay, who's the babes? He's talking about the apostles. These are the, the, the disciples that believe. Now, turn if you would to chapter 16 of Matthew. Matthew 16, verse 15 through 17. This is this great question. Lord Jesus says, Who do men say that I am? The Son of Man am. And uh, if you're there, verse 14, some would say, You're Elias, you're John the Baptist, you're one of the prophets. Verse 15, he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. But what is the Lord Jesus is saying? Peter, you, you, you know, is, again, God, you know, you can't believe on someone you don't know, and you have to use the scriptures and read about the Gospels to come to an intellectual knowledge of the Lord Jesus, but you see, that doesn't save you. Faith, faith has more than just an intellectual assent. You see, salvation is by revelation. God, Holy Spirit, God the Father told or revealed it to Peter, to James, to John, to Matthew, to all the apostles, all the disciples there. You know, see, it wasn't just book learning. It wasn't, they weren't educated into the kingdom. That's what that's the problem today in, in the modern gospel. You educate, you give them a bunch of facts, and then you get a you, you squeeze out a prayer. And since they confess some facts, they must be saved. Dear ones, that's not true. Salvation is by divine revelation. That we might know Christ in a saving way is a divine work by God, Holy Spirit, using the scriptures in the human heart. Look, if you would, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 6 through 7. Notice that, uh, let's read a little bit more of that just for a moment. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let me get there. Um, if we read, um, for example, if we include uh, verse 3, let's start at verse 3, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Christ's sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. You would think for a moment here, 
He said, if, if our gospel will be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. You see, just the intellect, intellectual preaching of the gospel, the facts, okay, will not deliver a sinner from the blindness of Satan. There has to be something else. You have to be translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son, Colossians chapter 1. But you see, we would say, we would throw up our hands, oh, there's no hope for the sinner, right? Satan's blindness, Satan's, you know, he's a very strong man, an angel. I mean, it's not just, you know, we, 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 we realize that he, he is, uh, uh, has many in bondage, many in blindness, many, you know, but you see, if that's the case, we're hopeless. If it's just intellectual persuasion. But notice, you know, verse 6. But for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. What happened when God used the scriptures? You were reading the scriptures. And all of a sudden, you were recreated. All of a sudden, uh, the glory of God... You saw in the face of Jesus Christ. Not a vision, not a dream, not anything like that. But in the scriptures, it says, um, for God commanded, notice that. Like the first creation, let there be light. The second creation, let there be light. There's nothing that's going to stop the, the, the revelation of God to a human heart. Nothing. Not even their own will. Why? Because God recreates the will. But see, this is before, this is, this is regeneration, this is not conversion. You see, there's a difference. You see, we, we, we are converted because God acted first. We act in response to that, cause and effect. We, we're converted because God acted first. He called us. And then when He called us, He gave us the power of the Holy Spirit. He recreated us. And what did God do? He commanded light to shine out of darkness. And he shined into hearts through the scriptures, and he gave us what? The knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, we saw the glory. Now, I've always said, you know, remember I said, Paul says, my conversion is a pattern. On the road of Damascus, dear ones, listen, when you got saved, who art thou, Lord? And you came to the realization. That it was the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Nobody could, I mean, in a sense, uh, uh, nobody could not convince you. you, you who art thou, Lord? Thou, 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 I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And then what did Paul say next? Lord, what would thou have me to do? You see, on the road to Damascus, see, Paul saw uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, nobody else did, and he heard a voice. Isn't that what happened to you when you got saved? You saw a light. Well, I'm not talking about a physical light or uh, invisible light. I'm talking about when you open up the scriptures, you know, like in California when I was there reading the scriptures, all of a sudden the Lord Jesus became so real. Boy, I want to know this guy. I want to, I want to sit at his feet. I want to learn from him. He's so interesting. And then I start loving him. How did I begin to love him? How did I say, well, I'm going to commit my life to you, Lord? Well, see, it's, it's that, that's, what Paul, that's what Paul's saying here, okay? In, in Galatians chapter 1, go back to verse 16, to reveal his son in me. You see, see the gospel reveals Christ in a sense, uh, and, and Stephen preached the gospel. Paul learned the facts. On the road to Damascus, Paul was converted, he was saved. But see, it was by divine revelation. Uh, he, he came in personal, he came into a living union, a living vital union with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Personally, vitally, experientially, by the Spirit of God. Paul walked away knowing the Lord Jesus Christ saved him. That's why he could say to the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? And then, in verse 16 there, Galatians 1, verse 16, you see, it says, that, it said, to reveal his son in me, then I preached, then I might preach him among the heathen. You see, only someone saved by grace, only one saved by the Lord Jesus Christ personally. You know, can you, you know, sometimes uh, I, I try to talk to people about 
saving faith? What it is to be a believer? What does it mean to be saved? Isn't that hard? The person that's lost. It's like, it's like I'm trying to explain, you know, I can try to get the intellectual part, I try to get the emotional part, I get the volitional part, I, I try to put to the scripture, and, and then, but comes down, you have to experience it. And once you have experienced it, and that's what Christianity is all about. It's not just intellectual, dog, 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 dog. no, no. You experience it. Once you come into a living, saving relationship with the Lord Jesus, you, you, oh, uh, yeah, now I know. <laughs> now I understand. Now I know what it is to be saved. So this is Paul's conversion here. It is uh, it's by divine revelation, okay? God it says uh, there in verse 15, but, but it pleased God. You see, salvation is by divine appointment and design. As many as are ordained to eternal life believed. Okay? Here in Acts 15, I mean in, in Galatians uh, 1.15, notice it says, But it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. You see, that is the testimony of every one of us that is saved here tonight. It is, dear ones. It is. He called us by His grace. He has revealed His Son in us. And now we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. We've been recreated and we're following the Lamb. And we know the Lord Jesus Christ personally, experientially, vitally. We're joined to Him. We're one flesh. That's salvation. But dear one, look. It's all by grace. 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 Quickly, look at... Paul, as he continues this next thing, to service. You see, he doesn't, he, you know, he, he, he's saying, well, God saved me. I, I met the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. He, he's revealed himself. I've seen the risen Lord. Well, wait a minute. I'm not like uh, some of these guys, uh, Oral Roberts and others. I, I've seen a 44 Jesus. No, the Lord Jesus saw, uh, Paul saw the Lord Jesus. Not just once, but many times. You see, what was the credentials or what are the uh, uh, requirements to be an apostle? You have to have seen the Lord Jesus resurrected in his resurrected form. Okay? Now, some, some would say in Acts chapter 1, well, you have to be with the Lord from the beginning to the end. No. Well, see, that's what that Damascus, you know, era, uh, when, when Paul is in Arabia and he's sitting at the Lord's feet for three years, what is the Lord doing? He's, he's personally training <laughs> Saul. Just like he personally trained Peter and all the other apostles. In verse 16, Galatians 1, verse 16, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I confer not with flesh and blood. Um, again, uh, Paul is uh, called to preach. Uh, let me read to you and follow with me if you would. Uh, Acts 9, Acts 9, verse 19. Acts 9, verse 19. I think this is the early days of uh, all of that Damascus. Now, some, th some things say, well, he got saved, and then he left Damascus, came back. Okay? And now he's back in Damascus. Okay? And now, notice what it says there. In Acts 9, verse 19. And when he had received me, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And uh, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. And so right from conversion, okay? And uh, the timeline is hard, but the idea is that he preached Christ. He didn't, well, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and sit at the feet of Peter for a while. And I'm going to go uh, to James, and I'm going to sit at the feet of Barnabas. I'm going to sit at the feet of Ananias. Ananias. I, I'm just going to sit at, I'm going to college, and I'm going to go to school, and, and I'm, I'm going to sharpen my skills. No. See, Paul is preaching Christ. He was called to preach. You see, he knew of grace. He knew of, of the Savior. And he began to preach. Now, he had all that intellectual Old Testament knowledge, right? I envy that in many ways. See, Paul could argue from the Old Testament scriptures here and there. That's amazing. Can we? 
that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Messiah. And so, you know, yeah, God used all that Old Testament knowledge, and, uh, and Paul is using it too, but you see, he, he's preaching, okay? <coughs> also, it tells us that Paul is, is called to be, uh, he said, I, I was called to preach the gospel to the heathen. He's going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, Paul's calling and commission, again, very important, was not of men. He says in verse 16, he said, Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. You see, uh, and, and then he's, he's saying the same thing. You know, I, I didn't receive the gospel uh, by men. I wasn't taught by men. I didn't receive it by men. Uh, I was taught by the Lord Jesus Christ personally. Uh, he saved me. He called me. And now he says in verse 16, Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. This is by his service. No, he wasn't there. Uh, he didn't go to Jerusalem uh, to sit down by the apostles. Okay, uh, Verse 17, it says, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. And there we see that's three years. Okay? Three years. Now, then Paul, again, he's going chronologically. You see, uh, we could go to the book of Acts, chapter 9, and we can see Luke's account by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But here Paul is giving the chronological account of his pre-conversion, his conversion, and his post-conversion. And one fight, you know, like, like he is brilliant in this. He's saying, after, over and over again, look, my gospel, I was taught by the Lord Jesus Christ personally. Before, you know, uh, it wasn't because I was a... Before I was saved, you know, pre-conversion, I knew something of grace. Uh, my conversion is guaranteed, you know, shows that. And my post-conversion, uh, you see, I began to preach Christ. I conferred not with uh, men, okay? Three years, it says there, uh, uh, notice in verse 18, as we can proceed, okay? It says, not by Peter. He said, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. <coughs> And abode with him 15 days. Now, uh, where is this at? Acts chapter 9, verse 26 to 30. Acts chapter 9, verse 26 to 30. We don't have to turn there, but, uh, but you know, see, uh, it's when Saul comes to, to Jerusalem. You see, he's there in Damascus, okay? And then, there, you know, there's a time uh, uh, slot that's missing, in a sense. It's, it's, it just goes on, okay? And now, Paul is back in Damascus. He's going to Jerusalem, okay? He says, uh, three years later, I'm going to Jerusalem, okay? And it, it is there, uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 26. And when Saul came to Jerusalem, he assailed to join himself to the, the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed that not he was a disciple. I love that word, assail, to join. You see, uh, I have a track on why, uh, why should we be a member of a church? I use Acts chapter 9. I use Paul's example. You see, you see, God adds you to a local church. Your responsibility is to join a local church. It's so simple. It really is. It's so fundamental. God adds to the church daily as such it should be saved. And what do you do? You join the church. Notice here. He has sailed to join. That means... He knocked more than once. <laughs> he got to Jerusalem. He says, man, I, I want to be part of you. I want to go to the local church. I want to be part of you. And they're saying, Get, you are a spy. You're a liar. You killed Christians. No way. No way. But the idea of sale is he tried over and over and over and over. Until finally, that's what it says there in verse uh, I think 28, uh, 27. But Barnabas took him. And brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way. Notice that. Divine revelation. He's an apostle. And that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Barnabas. I love Barnabas, man. He comes alongside and says, you know, for example, if we, if you want to join the church and we ask for witnesses about your life and your conversion and, uh, how you, you know, are we wrong in doing that? No, Barnabas is coming alongside and saying, look, uh, this guy's converted. 
He's living a life. He, 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 he's confessed Christ. Uh, he, he's preaching Christ, you see. And, and there's, a, there's a need, okay? When someone comes to our church and we, uh, we ask for a better a recommendation, commendation from another church. Is this, this person on the up and up? That's normal. That's not just Calvary Baptist. That's normal uh, Christian Baptist, uh, 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 Baptist principles, okay? And so, let's go on quickly. We'll get down here. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was then, and, then, and he was, meaning Saul, Paul, was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. Now that's an interesting part. That's a very interesting Greek word too. You know what that means? He had full privileges of being a member of the Jerusalem church. He wasn't barred from anything. He could come in and he could go out freely. Because he was a believer. He was a member of a local church. And they saw. And it's so great because that's what's happening. He, he had full privileges, full, full liberty, full benefits. He was a believer. He joined himself to a local church. And he wasn't denied anything. Could you imagine that? Well, you killed Christians. You put Christians to death. You, you made havoc on the church. And you could you imagine Saul just weeping? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. I was a blasphemer. I, I was a persecuted church. I killed Christians. I was, and he says, I did it ignorantly and unbelief, but God showed me mercy. God showed me mercy. And then it says here in verse 29, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Galatians, but they went about to sway him, which when the brother knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to what? Tarsus, his hometown. And so that's what Paul's saying here in Galatians chapter 1. Okay? I've been at Damascus. I go to Jerusalem. He's at Jerusalem how many days? 15 days. Two weeks. And the idea is here, um, so I guess Peter anointed him or Peter uh, ordained him. No, that, that's not at all. The, the whole idea is, uh, um, it said, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles. It says then, at verse 18, then after three years I went up to Jerusalem. Um, to see Peter. And then the idea is he went, the word see is there like a sightsee. He went up to, to, to get to know Peter. You get to know Peter. And uh, uh, he says there, and, but other of the apostles saw it, not save James. Maybe they, you know, they weren't, uh, like one man said, maybe uh, they were afraid of Saul or, you know, they were busy doing other things. But the fact is, you see, he says, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Uh, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem. I just had a short meeting. I met Peter, and I left. Okay? And the idea is that uh, Peter didn't give me a crash course on what the gospel is. Peter didn't sit down, and, and we, we did all, an all-nighter, and he's teaching me the gospel. Paul is saying, I went up to have a visit. I just, you know, I wanted to see Peter, and we had a, a, a nice visit. Okay? But know something else. When Paul went to Jerusalem there and visited Peter, there's something very interesting. In Acts chapter, let's see if I got it written down here. Acts 9, verse 22, I think it is, that uh, while there, maybe I don't have it there. Let me, let me think about that for a minute. But the idea is that while he's at Jerusalem, well, I, I read it, okay, verse 29. And he spake boldly in the name of Lord Jesus, okay, and disputed. While he was there, he preached. For those 15 days, he was out on the streets preaching. And then uh, it says, it's very important, uh, verses 21 and 22 uh, in Galatians. Um, it says afterwards. Look at verse 21. Galatians 1, 21. Afterwards, I came into the region of Syria, Cilicia. This is, this is where he's at Tarsus. Okay? And uh, some people believe that it was at least 10 years. So uh, he, he is saved on the road to Damascus. He spends three years in Arabia. He spends 15 days in Jerusalem. And after that, you don't hear anything about Paul. Notice what it says there. Uh, verse 22. 
and was unknown by faith unto the churches of Judah, which were in Christ. He, was, he, he just slipped out, and he went back to his home town in Tarsus. Now, what, now there's only one other time that, that Saul that was in Jerusalem. That's what he was sent with, I think, Barnabas or, or for, for a gift, okay? But uh, afterwards, okay, um, how, did, uh, how did Paul come back into the picture? Look, if you would, at Acts chapter 11. Remember, uh, the, the, uh, through the persecution of Saul, which is interesting, the gospel goes out and many are scattered and eventually, in Acts chapter 11, the gospel comes to Antioch. Antioch. And so Barnabas is sent down, okay, to confirm and, and preach and comfort and, and strengthen the brother. And Barnabas sees what's going on there in Antioch, and what does he do? Look what it says there in Acts chapter 11, verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And so, uh, some commentators say from, from this 15 days in Jerusalem to the time of Antioch, when Barnabas goes and, and gets Saul, it's 10 years in the back, doing nothing. No, I'm not saying do nothing, but we don't know. Some people say, uh, some speculate that he, Saul was evangelizing the heathen in that area. I, I, you know, but the fact is that from t ten years from that first visit, okay, to now, uh, he's called to come to Antioch, and he begins to do his ministry with Barnabas. But see, what is the whole point of that? What is the point of this chronological, uh, especially with verse 20? I, you know, before God, I lied not. I'm telling you all the facts. And what he's saying is that, look, I'm vindicating my apostleship. Okay? My message, he says, okay, was, uh, he says, uh, in verse 11, was preached to me is not after man. Verse 12, neither I received it of man, neither was I taught it but of my revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, it wasn't the apostles, it wasn't Barnabas, it wasn't Ananias, it was nobody, not the Jerusalem church had nothing to do. And it's very important we see that. Because he's going to use that when he comes to Jerusalem 15 years later in, in, in uh, chapter 2. You see, Paul is an apostle by his own right, as it were. You see, God called him, God commissioned him, God saved him. God gave him the gospel. And that's what he's preaching. And as he vindicates his apostleship, he is actually vindicating the message. Now, we're going to find out the message from uh, Peter and James and John. Same message. Same gospel. Okay? It's the Judaizers, like in Acts 15. They're coming in. And, and they're using James and John, you know. Uh, they're using uh, the Jerusalem elders. They're, you know, we'll see in Acts chapter, I mean, in, in Galatians chapter 2. Uh, but you see, Paul and Peter and John and James and Matthew, all the apostles, they're preaching the same gospel, because there's only one gospel. And, and these Judaizers are coming in and, and, and using James' name and using Peter's name. And saying, "Well, Paul, you went up to Jerusalem, and uh, you, 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 you know, but you're defected now. You're not preaching the same gospel as James and John and others there in Jerusalem." And Peter, I mean, Paul, is saying, no, "No, no, no, I'm preaching the gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to me." So let's conclude here. God saved Saul of Tarsus and taught him personally. That's amazing, isn't it? The Lord Jesus taught him the gospel of grace. Now, I think it's pretty interesting that the Lord Jesus, through the Spirit of God, through the uh, Scripture, through other pastors, other men, uh, they have taught us the gospel of grace. You know that? Personally. They've taught us the gospel of grace. Maybe that's why 
Uh, Jude says that we ought to earnestly contend for the truth once delivered unto the saints because, you see, the gospel of grace is being destroyed right in our very midst. Is it worth it? Is it, is it lovable? Is it, you know, is it valuable? The gospel of grace. The Lord Jesus taught uh, Paul, of Sar Paul of Tarsus the gospel of grace personally. And we're going to see how important that is, really, you know, when Paul personally confronts Peter. You think, you know, confrontation, ain't, you know, is not a good word right now, you know, confronting people doing this and that, you know, you know, but Paul had to confront Peter. And you say, for Paul to do that, it must have been a very serious issue. And it was. He tells about it in chapter 2. You take time to read chapter 2. He says the gospel, there, you see, the idea of the gospel came to a point of being totally sidetracked and derailed in chapter 2 of Galatians. They were not preaching the gospel as Paul was taught and they weren't, weren't uh, abiding by the gospel. Okay, They weren't living the gospel. And Paul came in and comes in and says, hey, 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 this is not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you, you're not going to sit at another table and, and separate from the Gentiles who are believers. No, no. We're, we're one body. Grace. Meat does not commend me to God. Peter, what are you doing? That's what Paul did. We'll see that. Okay? Three years at the feet of the Lord Jesus. Only a personal saved, only a person saved by grace can preach the gospel of grace. God called Paul to the gospel ministry to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Paul says he was uh, one born out of due season. But he says, I labor the, uh, you know, I labor the most more than all the apostles. And he said, it was all the grace of God. It was the effectual working of God, Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, 8-10. What is the result? Finally, let's close with first, uh, chapter 1. <coughs> verses uh, 22 through 24 for real quick. Notice what it says there in Galatians chapter 1. I, I mentioned to you at verse 22, and was unknown by the faith unto the churches of Judah, Judea, which were in Christ. You see, he, he was he, he was just one, he went away for 10 years. But see, uh, but then it says, uh, verse 23 says, preach the faith which once he destroyed. He preached the gospel of grace. The Apostle Paul vindicated his apostleship, thereby vindicating his gospel. Verse 24. And they glorified God in me. You see, the gospel of grace is not of works. It's not of Christian Judaism. No, no. Uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus, the one Paul saw personally, the one who taught Paul the doctrines of grace, justification by faith alone. I mean, you go to Romans, you go to all the, you know, the epistles and, and how Paul is such an essential apostle. Three quarters of the New Testament, they say, is written by Saul. And dear ones, listen, the, the idea is that Jesus gave us a very simple gospel to love each other and grace and mercy and love of God, and then come along this, this, this her heretical uh, Jude uh, Jew, uh, you know, Judaizer, this guy named Saul, and he ruined everything. That's what a lot of people think. A lot of theologians, okay? Liberal theology. But dear ones, no, no. The gospel that Lord Jesus preached is the gospel that Paul preached, that we preach. And we have to make sure we preach. You see, the Lord Jesus' gospel is the same gospel that Paul preaches. The risen Lord Jesus would continue to reveal himself to Apostle Paul. I think of uh, I think of First Corinthians, I think nine, uh, or I mean uh, in Acts, where he's in uh, Corinth, and uh, the Lord Jesus reveals himself to Paul and says, uh, "Don't be afraid. Don't be bashful in the sense. Preach the gospel, for I have many souls in this city." You know, the Lord Jesus revealed himself. Uh, revelations of, of uh, Second Corinthians. Uh, you read the Second Thessalonians, First Thessalonians. We've studied. The Lord Jesus revealed. Uh, uh, himself to the Lord Jesus again and again. And so, in conclusion, Paul vindicated his apostleship in, uh, in Galatians chapter 1. And by doing so, he vindicated 
that his gospel was not of men, not taught by men, he didn't receive it of men, it wasn't the Jerusalem church, it wasn't the apostles, it wasn't Barnabas, it wasn't him, it was the Lord Jesus Christ personally, and that's why Paul could say, you know, if any man, any angel, even himself, preach any other gospel, let him be a curse. And as we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto them that you have received, let him be accursed. And so Paul ends that part in Galatians chapter 1. He vindicated his apostleship, he vindicated his message, and now, you know, he's going to come and, and bring us to a point in, in, in chapter 2 where he has, he's going to Jerusalem. Those who in verse 2, I mean uh, chapter 2, verse 1, then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by what? Revelation. See, the Lord Jesus knew the gospel was in danger. You see, uh, the simulation or uh, the, the hypocrisy of, of Peter and, and the Judaizers. You see, God saw the gospel was in danger, and He's going to send Saul <laughs> with the authentic gospel. And so that's, uh, hope that will bless your heart. Realize that, you see, uh, salvation is by revelation. And if you know the grace of God, then you can tell others about the grace of God. And you know the gospel, and you can tell others about the gospel. But dear ones, you know, just remember, in many ways, the Lord Jesus has taught you personally the gospel, hasn't he? Through the word of God, through the spirit of God. Yes, other pastors, other things. But you see, you know the gospel, don't you? It's what saved you. It's the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. It's grace. But when God pleased, He separated me from my woman and called me by His grace. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the Word of God. Lord, we do want to preach the grace of God. We want to preach all about Christ because it's all about Him. Lord, uh, in a way we have it in a, in a way a little easier. Uh, Lord, we have the Bible. Uh, though men and women uh, reject the Word of God, uh, Lord, our authority does not come from Calvary Baptist Church. It doesn't come from Pastor Tom Newton. Our authority comes from the Word of God, and that's the gospel we preach. As not only have we learned it, and uh, yes, you've taught us the gospel through men, to pastors, to books, to the scriptures, all that. But uh, Father, uh, it's your gospel, and we ask that you would bless your gospel in the saving of many, that you might receive glory and honor. And that's what we want. We want the Lord Jesus to be honored and glorified, and that, as it says again, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord, that no flesh would glory in thy presence. Lord, it's all by grace. You saved us by grace. You called us by grace. And what a blessing that you would uh, commission us to serve you and to preach the gospel and tell others it's all by grace, mercy through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Bless now, we pray. And thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name.